Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. Our guest today is Dr. Mark Lewis, a developmental neuroscientist and currently a professor at the Radboud University in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. For many years, his work centred on dynamic systems approaches to understanding the development of emotions and personality. But recently, he's perhaps become most well known for his account of his own personal experience of drug addiction, memoirs of an addictive brain, and merging that with the neuroscience of addiction. In his latest book, The The Biology of Desire, Why Addiction is Not a Disease, he argues that seeing addiction as a disease is not only wrong, but also harmful. And this will be the topic of our discussion today. Hi, Barry. Thank you for for inviting me. Okay, well, to start then, uh, Mark, could you begin by telling us something of your background and how that led you to write the book? Sure. Um... Yeah, well, um, are we allowed to use four-letter words in this? Yeah, you can fire away. <laughs> I was a bit of a fuck-up within my 20s, <laughs> quite seriously, in fact. I, I, I was uh, pretty seriously addicted to opiates from the second half of my 20s, did a lot of crime, uh, stealing and stuff, got uh, convicted a couple of times. And, and after all that, I finally did quit around the age of 30, uh, I'd been kicked out of grad school for, well, for having a criminal record, and they, they didn't think that young psychologists should be breaking into pharmacies and stealing drugs, and yeah. I, I saw their point, you know. Uh, but then I got back into school, got my, my doctorate and so forth, became a professor in developmental psychology, and and I, I switched from that topic, or I didn't really switch, I merged that my developmental thinking with the study of neuroscience, especially uh, the emotional brain, and did neuroscience research for about 15 years. And then I thought I'd like to write a, a book or books that integrated the life of the brain, so to speak, with what's going on in our experience to fuse together. I mean, the brain is constantly doing stuff, you know, every yeah. Every few milliseconds, it's doing stuff, and we are constantly experiencing stuff and doing stuff, and these are happening, obviously, totally in in sync in some ways. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be neat to try to write something that could put the two streams together, almost like a fuse it into a single narrative? So that's what I tried to do in my first book, Memoirs of an Addicted Brain, yeah. and that was that was about my addiction, and and then you know the the neuroscience of addiction, putting those together. And then a few years later, with this most recent book, uh, The Biology of Desire, I've used other people's stories. I wanted, I've gotten very interested in addiction as a scientist, as a one-time addict, uh, and, and as someone who actually have come to care a lot about other people who have serious addiction problems, having been there and you know, realizing what a mess their lives often become. So I wanted to write about other people, other people who have struggled with addiction, but once again, to fuse their stories with something about what's going on in the brain. And so I've done that in, in the most recent book. Okay. Could you then give us an, uh, an outline of your argument set out in your book of why uh, addiction is not a disease? Yeah, so that's the subtitle of the book, and it's a, it's a pretty important subtitle. Um, that because it, it's it, well, it brings the controversy to uh, to a point. And the reason for the controversy is because there's a very powerful I don't know what to call them um, club that has a lot of money and a lot of political and social clout, and they're they're sort of embodied in the NIH, the National Institutes of Health in the U.S., but also in, uh, in various medical associations and addiction associations, and even in AA to a large degree. And their definition of addiction is very clearly uh, stated. Addiction is a is a not only is it a disease. Addiction is a chronic brain disease. That's how they define it. And uh, well, as a developmentalist, uh, that never made much sense to me. Um, I see things as developing, not in terms of pathology or disease so much, but in terms of a developmental process. And with addiction in particular. I see it very much as a developmental process. I think that it grows and uh, self-perpetuates and builds on itself 
uh, until people get into very difficult straits. Yeah. You know, no one's arguing that it's not serious and that it can't, it, that doesn't destroy lives. It, it often does. Uh, not always, certainly, but, but it sometimes does. Um, so here's the thing. We, so these people, NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, that's part of the NIH, they actually fund 90% of the, uh, of the addiction science research, addiction neuroscience, especially research in the world, not just in the U.S., but in the world. Wow. So it, it, it's a very, <laughs> you can see how powerful that would be. Yeah. And uh, so as a result, I suppose you could say that a lot of the science that comes out is endorsing the disease model, which creates a feedback cycle because that model continues to grow, proliferate, dominate, and then fund the research, which then supports it. Now, I'm not saying all this research is bad. It's not. The disease model has helped us learn a lot about what goes on in the brain and addiction, and that's all good. Uh, the problem is the interpretation of the data. Okay. Okay, so so I interpret the data differently. Uh, these folks start off by saying that addiction changes the brain, and it makes all these changes, and therefore addiction is a disease. Well, I don't argue that addiction changes the brain. It most certainly does. But, you know, so does, uh, well, learning to become a taxi driver in London. Yeah. You know the classic study that, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> the, the hippocampus of London cab drivers is supposed to be 20% uh, larger or heavier than those of other people because they have to learn all 50,000 different streets. Uh, learning changes the brain. It has to change the brain. The brain is designed to change uh, in response to experience. That is precisely what learning consists of. And the more intense the learning, the more singular, the more driven, the more uh, it is motivated by powerful desires, and the more it's a response to a repeated experience, then the more extensive you would expect the brain changes to be. Okay. Okay. So with addiction, you've got these two very powerful things. You've got uh, a, a very strongly hedonic experience, a powerful experience of pleasure or relief. It, it may not be pleasure, it may be relief, but that's pretty powerful stuff. That's, uh, that's highly rewarding. And you've got repetition. Why? Because, well, for one thing, any addictive experience, whether it's heroin or cocaine, gambling, sex, Video games, what, what? Well, I don't know about video games. You could probably keep doing that for a while, but most addictive experiences don't last very long. Yeah. And what about the wanting, though? Isn't that a big part of it as well? The wanting, yeah. So that has everything to do with the hedonic appeal. Oh, okay. Is you want this very badly because it's it's pleasurable, it's fun, it takes you out of yourself, it gives you a sense of power, freedom, release, well-being, safety. These kinds of, you know, these are really desirable emotional states. So the want, the wanting, I mean, we've got this big part of uh, our brains, this rather ancient structure called the striatum, right in the middle of our of our forebrain, whose whose purpose is to uh, is, is to get us to pursue goals. Yeah, that's its job. Now you're only going to pursue a goal unless, well, if you're a frog, you don't really need. Uh, much, you know, you just need a fixed action pattern, so your tongue will shoot out when the fly goes by, right? But but for mammals, uh, and even birds, perhaps, but certainly for mammals, you need motivation. You need you need a desire. That That's the only thing that's going to get you to do stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> so desire is this linchpin and this algorithm and this equation. Desire is what keeps us going after the experience. The experience is repeated over and over. The more it's repeated, the more brain change you get in the striatum. The striatum becomes highly sensitized to cues that represent the addictive experience, whether it's you know driving by the liquor store, um, whether it's just a dream you had last night, an image, a memory, uh, finding a couple of pills on the bathroom floor, Whatever the cue is, it releases dopamine, a particular neuromodulator, goes up into the striatum. The striatum kind of wakes up and says, I want it. So when I mention wanting as opposed to liking, I suppose I'm thinking of, you know, when you, you have a piece of chocolate, you like that first, but you, but you carry on chasing that chocolate, even though the, the, it's, you're never going to get that same hit like the first one. So what's going on there? Right, right. One of the biggest contributions to addiction neuroscience has been the work of Kent Berridge, who showed through a whole bunch of elegant experiments 
that the wanting system in the brain is different from the liking system. Okay. The wanting system, which is desire, which is why I call, I mean, addiction is about desire. It's not about pleasure. It's not about liking. It's about desire. Yeah. Desire is what keeps you going back. Now, obviously, there's got to be some some pleasure at, somewhere near the beginning or else you don't have the desire. That's the hook. That's the hook, yes. But, but, but you got to win some money once or twice at, you know, when you're gambling in order to keep going back and try try again and again, right? Yeah. But but once uh, once the desire system gets tuned to the um, sought after goal, then it starts to function almost independently, and and it becomes more and more sensitized to these cues. As I say, you get synaptic changes. That is to say, changes in the connections between the neurons within the striatum and nearby areas like uh, other areas of the brain that are also very much in charge of motivation and emotion, like the famous amygdala. Yeah. And this rewiring, well, this is what they're talking about when they call addiction a disease. They say, well, look, all these systems are getting rewired, so it's a disease. I said, well, no, actually, the brain is supposed to rewire itself. That's how brains develop. That's how we, that's how we learn. Well, it's just normal. It's normal. So, so, in fact, this is a learning process which is unfortunately gets more and more narrow because it builds on itself because other goals become less and less important. Okay. okay. Yeah. So it's got it's got the singularity built in. But that's not the brain's fault. I mean, that's not caused by a, a virus or something and, or, or some disease process. It's just that because of the way the world is structured, we find these things that we start to uh, go after again and again. And other goals fade in importance. They kind of drop off the edge of the table. They, they fall off the radar. OK, and then um, you make another point that against the disease model, there's certain addictions that have nothing to do with substances, like, for example, as you mentioned, pornography or addiction to the Internet. And that also challenges the disease model, doesn't it? The fact that a lot of addictions uh, are just behavioral in a sense. Exactly. Yeah. Another another aspect of the definition as handed down by the NIH and these organizations is that drugs cause addiction. And there's been a lot of controversy and uh, we talked about Johan Hari's book Chasing the Scream that's that's brought a lot of it to a head about the war on drugs the idea behind the war on drugs is that you stamp out drugs and therefore you get rid of addiction uh, but no it doesn't work that way in fact nicotine patches replace nicotine a hundred percent they replace all the nicotine that you're missing when you give up smoking you might know something about that I'm not <laughs> sure but um so now, does that mean that when you get a nicotine patch, you stop smoking? No. For 17% of the population, yes. For the other 83%, no. They keep on smoking, which shows that it's not about the nicotine. It's not about the chemical. It's about the activity. And when you get to gambling and the so-called behavioral addictions, it's all the more clear. That the drugs, there's no drug causing the addiction. It's a it's a behavior that is self-perpetuating, self-reinforcing and a, and a kind of thinking or a belief system that that you keep reinforcing, consolidating, streamlining, adjusting, perfecting. And that belief system says this thing is what is going to help me. This thing is what I need. This thing is going to make me feel better. Sure. Yeah. I saw a TED talk with Johan Hari uh, and at the beginning of the, um, the talk, he was saying that the arguably the war on drugs and potentially the, the disease model uh, gets started about 100 years ago with a, a simple experiment which they did with rats where they had these rats in a cage in a very constricted cage and there was a, uh, a water bottle and, a, and also a bottle with a, I think either cocaine or heroin and uh, the rats then basically overdosed on the heroin and cocaine they didn't really touch the water but there's some called Bruce Alexander that's really challenged this, hasn't it? Yeah. Apparently, that one experiment was was the main experiment that started this way of thinking. Uh, I don't know. Uh, would you agree with that, uh, or have I got that a bit? Have I got that a bit wrong? Well, no. I I think that's. I mean, I just read Johann Harry's book too, and uh, you know, I didn't know the history, uh, but it's it's true. Well, what well, I do know the work of Bruce Alexander. And, and he, you know, he's kind of a god in the world of, uh, well, shall we say, social explanations for addiction. Yeah. So what he did in his research in the late 80s and 90s was he um, 
first of all, I replicated what you just said, put rats in single cages, house one to a cage in a metal cage with nothing else to do. You give them a bottle of morphine and a bottle of water side by side. You sweeten the morphine so that it's not doesn't taste too awful. And yeah, they, they prefer the morphine. No, then he took those rats and he stuck them in, in a large enclosure with plywood sides and wood shavings and rat toys and most important, other rats. Right. So they were no longer isolated. And, <laughs> and guess what? They stopped taking the morphine. They, not only, not every single one, but many of them, I don't remember the exact percentage, many of them not only didn't prefer the morphine, but if they were already physically addicted to the morphine, they got clean. They went through withdrawal symptoms so they could get off the morphine because they preferred to play with their, with their buddies and play with their toys. Well, that's amazing. And then, and then there's a parallel with that with the Vietnam War as well, isn't there? Yeah, now there's some controversy about that, but the, the main idea is that you had a certain number of uh, U.S. Uh, soldiers, when they were in Vietnam, they got addicted to morphine. I don't remember what percentage, 10, 20 percent, something like that. And then when they came back to the States, everybody thought they were going to remain uh, heroin addicts, and that was kind of a, an unpleasant thought. But in fact, uh, a large number of them, 85 to 90 percent of them, stopped taking heroin. So, so the Bruce Alexander explanation, the Rat Park explanation, is that they n were no longer in a stressful, nasty environment. They were now in a, in a nice, friendly environment, a uh, sort of Rat Park for humans, if you like. Yeah. Uh, the suburbs, I guess. And, and they stopped. So that's, that's that explanation. And, and it seems to verify what, what happens with these rats. But the count, the other explanation, and I think we need to give this credence as well, is that they didn't have as much access. They, they you know, in, in yeah. Vietnam, Southeast Asia, you know, heroin's just about growing on trees. Well, that's not the case in, you know, Connecticut or something. Okay, well, what, what are the, the main psychological issues that are involved with addiction? Yeah, so that's the question, isn't it? So this is, I mean, addiction is a serious kind of bad habit. It's it's highly uh, condensed, highly uh, reinforced, consolidated uh, across many networks. Those networks include not only the striatum, but also parts of the prefrontal cortex and other areas that are connected uh, to, well, things like identity, social perception, self-perception, uh, how you evaluate other people, how you, just your basic sort of outlook or expectation about novelty, whether the world is going to treat you well or treat you badly. Yeah. All, the, all these areas are involved as well. Sure. But, okay, so the, the kind of social explanation to addiction or developmental explanation, which, which, I, which, you know, which I endorse, is that the 10% who become addicted, whether it's to pain medications or cocaine or anything else, uh, are people who have had difficulties in their lives who have had either trauma, uh, psycho probably trauma of psychological or physical or sexual uh, in childhood or adolescence, or for some other reasons have had nasty experiences that have led to depression or anxiety. And, and that's it. That, that right there is the main variable. If you're feeling good about yourself and about the world, you're not likely to become an addict. Okay, but that sort of ties in with another model of that's prevalent is the, the self-medication model. How, how does your learning model differ from that one? Well, it it doesn't. I just it just differs in emphasis. Right. Uh, it's really exactly what. I'm, if you're depressed or anxious, you're feeling crummy, um, and your orbital frontal cortex is expecting that situations are going to turn bad, and your part of your brain that's in charge of identity is so sees yourself as a not very good person and likely to be rejected. Uh, then you are going to, when you play around with substances and you find that those feelings are relieved and those parts of the brain are, shall we say, activated in different ways, different configurations, you say, okay, this feels good. I like this. I'm going to do it again. You're basically medicating yourself. Yeah. It's like taking an antidepressant. I mean, it's really no different. So that's, yeah, I, I, I think that model is very uh, uh, viable and very, very sensible. Okay. What's now appeal and how does that relate to what we're talking about? So there's a couple of psychological um, phenomena, uh, biases 
that make the learning process when it comes to addiction all the more insidious. And one of them is what I call now appeal, which is technically called delayed discounting. And that means that immediate rewards are seen as more valuable than they really are. And long term rewards are seen as less valuable. So, well, that's why I call it now appeal. The thing that's coming right now seems to be highly valuable. So now this is a cognitive bias that is shared by all mammals and also some species of birds. We like the low hanging fruit, the low hanging sexual partners, the low hanging you know, whatever it is, if you see what I mean. Uh, and and we're, we're designed to go after them. But with addiction, it becomes a real problem because you, you take this thing, it lasts for six hours, and you want it again, and you want it now, not tomorrow, not next week, you want it right now. It seems a lot more valuable than it is because you learn that it's not as much fun as it used to be, and maybe it's hardly any fun at all right now, but you still want it really badly. And the appeal of next week of being a healthier, happier person with some money in the bank, out of jail and not in trouble with your with your mate is seems less valuable. So there's that that scales are all out of whack. OK. And as a result, you end up in this kind of like perpetually repeating present tense. So you're kind of stuck in the present tense of of what what you want now. Uh, and and you, you actually, I think, lose the skill, the capacity to think in any kind of intelligent way or any way at all about the future. Addicts are not good at thinking about the future. They've almost lost the knack for thinking about next week. And what's happening neurologically when that process is going on? Do the two parts of your brain actually start to become disconnected? Yes, exactly. And to me, that's actually the most interesting uh, phenomenon here is um, the, the striatum is normally connected to, to areas in the prefrontal cortex. So you got the striatum, this kind of primitive machine that just says, I want, I want, I'm motivated, I'm aimed, I'm focused, I'm going to go get it. Well, that naturally links up with the prefrontal cortex that says, hold on a minute, uh, let's think about this. Uh, we got to figure out how to do this in the best way so we don't get in trouble. You know, all that stuff, judgment, perspective taking and all that. That set of fibers, that actual, that set, that set of, uh, of, of connections, of, of, of uh, actual connections, of synaptic connections between these systems starts to become less activated. And when synapses become less activated, they start to prune. They start to actually fade away and disappear. Well, the disease folks will look at some of these, this loss of some synaptic density uh, in, some, in some prefrontal areas, in some long-term addicts, and say, aha, disease, there's a disease because look, we've lost synapses in this really important area. But you know what? If you look at the brain in a developmental uh, kind of uh, uh, high-speed movie, there's this lovely movie that shows the brain developing from the age of four to the age of 20. And, and, and guess what happens over those 16 years? More than anything else, the brain prunes itself. It's massively pruning itself. That's how it becomes more efficient. So it sort of economizes in a sense. It, it... Exactly, yeah. It, it's, it's just like natural selection. There's competition among all these synapses. Well, the ones that get used the most are the ones that become strengthened and remain uh, connected up to other synapses. The ones that don't get used, they just fall by the wayside. They actually retract. Okay, but that doesn't mean that the brain becomes ossified, neither does it? Not at all. It's actually, again, becoming more efficient at doing something without thinking about it. Right. Okay. Now, that's, think about it. I mean, that's, <laughs> it might sound like a disease. Oh, you're not thinking about stuff. Well, that's pretty serious. Um, think about, you know, how we often, well, how we drive a car, how we eat a pizza, how we carry on a conversation. So much of what we do, we're not thinking about it because it's highly habitual. So it's like if you're learning a new, if you're learning to waltz at the beginning, you're thinking about one, two, three, all the steps and everything. But once you get, once it becomes habit, then you can do it in a flowing, very efficient way that also is aesthetic and that can have real beauty. But it's a sort of habit in a sense. Exactly so. So, so the, again, the brain is becoming more efficient at focusing on something very narrow, uh, doing it again and again, and, and doing it in a rather skillful way, like you know. Uh, I don't know about other people, but when I was scoring drugs in my 20s, it wasn't uh, 
so easy sometimes. I had to go through some pretty serious gyrations in order to get my stuff. So it wasn't that I couldn't focus. It's just that I was no longer thinking about whether or not I should and what, what, the, what the consequences were. I just did it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Anyway, um, can we move on to a, a, another one of these psychological issues? Ego fatigue. What's that? So that's another one of these psychological phenomena that, that's that's pretty insidious. It, it simply means ego fatigue means losing the capacity uh, for cognitive self control. Okay. Okay. And and it, it is a kind of fatigue. It's kind of like you know if you hold your arm out out at the side, uh, you can do that for a few minutes. But you try doing it for an hour or two, it's not going to work, right? Yeah. It just doesn't work. So the brain is not designed to maintain high effort self inhibition, uh, self, uh, yeah, to inhibit impulses uh, actively for periods of time. And there's a, a bunch of research, hundreds of experiments that show this, that, that when people, for example, one of them I just read about, uh, people will have to watch a movie that is very emotional. And one group is told, uh, do not show your emotions uh, at all. And the other group has said, you know, you can show whatever emotions you want or something like that. The ones who have to inhibit after that seven minute movie clip, uh, they're not as good at cognitive tests that require self-control. So supervised cognitive activity. Well, OK, now take that into the addiction sphere. Now you've got people who are trying like crazy to suppress their impulses, not only for five minutes, but for hour after hour and day after day. And they, they can't do it. They lose the capacity. So they just, after a while, they say, fuck it. I, I can't do this anymore. I'm just going to go and get some stuff. Okay, so... And, and let me tell you, one more interesting, really interesting thing about ego fatigue is that there, there's basically two ways that you can get rid, that you can overcome an impulse. One is by suppressing it, and the other is by reframing. Re and I, I think this has something to do with your, with your philosophy in the middle way. Integration, yeah. Yeah, so reframing, or what they call reappraisal, actually works to overcome ego fatigue. Once you reframe something, you can actually maintain cognitive control very nicely. But if you try to repress it, and, and remember what Nancy Reagan, I don't know if you know who Nancy Reagan is. Yeah, just say no. Just say no. <laughs> well, that doesn't work. It just doesn't work. That's yeah. suppression, and it doesn't work. Yeah, well, I suppose it's this idea that, well, ego depletion or fatigue, is a really good example because it's, it's a, you know you only have a, a limited amount of sort of psychic energy if you want to call it something else at any given time and uh, you're dealing with a sort of finite resource in a sense uh, yeah the resource model is one of the competing models to try to explain this thing uh, well what I love about it is that when you look at the brain uh, <laughs> that dissociation between the prefrontal cortex and the striatum that we were talking about that you, you see in long-term addiction well, you see that in the short term with ego fatigue and with now appeal. In both cases, in both of these phenomena, uh, you get more action in the motivational parts, the amygdala or the striatum, and less action in the prefrontal cortex or its close allies, another area that's very close to it that's also involved in uh, self-control. So it's almost like a microcosm of addiction right there, and you get the same kind of a disconnect or re reduction in communication be between well, cognition and, and desire, so to speak, or, or thinking and feeling. Okay. Um, you also talk in the book about the importance of autonomy, or, uh, or arguably one of the drawbacks of the disease model is that although for many addicts it's helpful in the sense that they can say, this is not my fault, mm. uh, but you sort of put your your fate in, into the hands of other people in an, an extent. And that, in, in a way, is a disempowering process. C could you talk about that a little bit and, and, and the opposite of that empowerment? Yeah, sure. That's, um, yeah, it's pretty important because like the disease model uh, camp, um, well, they say there's two very good reasons to endorse the disease model. One is that it's scientifically valid. And the other is that it's helpful to addicts because it reduces the stigma. Yeah. Well, if I've got a disease, then, you know, if I do all these nasty things, then it's not really my fault, right, if I've got a disease. So that takes away the, the stigma. Well, I, I think the scientific part we've already dealt with. I, th I think it's just wrong. Yeah. As, as far as helping addicts, most of the addicts I've talked to, now, granted, this is a bit of a, a skewed sample because I don't 
talk, I don't go into AAA meetings mostly and talk to people, but I talk to the people who want to talk to me. Um, but many of them don't want to think of themselves as having a disease. They don't see it that way. They don't feel they have a disease. Being told you have a chronic disease that makes you do bad things isn't exactly good news, you know. No. <laughs> it doesn't make your day. So so that's part of it. But as you say, it's also disempowering. It, it, a chronic disease is something that you can't control. You put yourself in the hands of experts, doctors. You do what you're told. Uh what your behavior is prescribed rather than discovered. Um, well, if addiction is about realigning your feelings, desires, and wishes with your, with your, um, just say realigning your feelings, desires, and wishes, you have to, def you have to find that goal for yourself. You have to really decide this is what I want. That's, that's nothing like being told what to do. It's an entirely different process. So, so, so I think this, the, the destigmatization to whatever extent that that works, and I don't know how well it works at all, but to whatever extent, it's not worth the cost, the cost of that loss of sense of self-efficacy. Yeah, I can see that, but I can, um, I think you've mentioned that people who suffer from addiction have raised concern with you about the model, though, but, um, uh, the, the, the learning model, but um, maybe the, is there a confusion there? I think there's often, a feeling that if you're not proposing the disease model, then you're proposing the choice model, which is often associated with this idea that addicts lack moral fibre. I think that was the term used in the sort of 30s and yeah. 40s, that there's something morally deficient about you in a way if, if you are an, an addict. I think that choice model is still out there, isn't there? There are certain proponents of it say, yeah, uh, addicts, yeah, are morally deficient or they're lazy, or, but you're not, you're not saying that at all, are you? No, no, I'm not. I, I think that's kind of a false dichotomy. Uh, I, some people who advocate the choice model are, are, are not um, using it as a, as a sledgehammer to bash addicts. People like Gene Heyman are, are uh, try, try to make a very reasonable case for how the subtleties involved in choice. Uh, whereas other people like, uh, oh, what's his name, that British guy, the brother of the... Peter Hitchens. Yes, Peter Hitchens. <laughs> uh, says that, uh, yeah, the, the addicts, you know, they just like to get high. That's their choice. And we shouldn't feel too sorry for them because they're selfish and, uh, you know, indulgent. Well, first of all, choice is not a simple thing. I mean, what, whoever, whoever imagined that a choice doesn't involve the brain... B, the choice was a simple logical process of, you know, A versus B. Well, it's not. Yeah. A choice depends on all kinds of things, context, previous associations, mood, what side of the bed you woke up on, all these subtleties. So choice is not simple. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's almost an absolute view of free will in a sense, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, that just doesn't make, make much sense to a lot of us. So to say that addiction is in some ways partly, you know, volitional, which I think it is, doesn't mean that you're just sitting there, you know, deciding, well, I think I'll do this. You know, it's not, it just isn't like that. Yeah, no, that, that makes so much sense to me. Okay, why is it important to to have a narrative about your life? I'm thinking of the something you mentioned in your book about research done in native communities in Canada and what role desire plays in recovery. Yeah, that, that's a, to me, a very um, fruitful area. The desire part is fairly simple. You, we, we often hear that addicts have to hit bottom before they uh, stop. Well, not everyone has to hit bottom, but I, I actually did. Uh, and many people do. And why is that important? Because that's when you really want to change. You really, really, really want to change and get rid of this this damn thing. Yeah. So that, that's the desire part. But as far as the narrative part, I think you also need to have, a, in order to choose a different future, you don't want to choose the future of, the most obvious future is I'm going to be an addict next week and the week after, since I have been an addict for the last 10 years, I, that's what I'm going to be in the future. Well, no, you want to choose another future. How do you imagine another future? How do you even start to visualize who you might become. And I think that's where narrative comes in. You need to have a sense of continuity and a story of your life that can have a happy ending, so to speak, not to be too, too cheesy about it, but that can have a, a different ending than, than, than just repeating the same stupid, you know, cycle of day after day doing the same thing. Yeah. And how do we go about this? 
um, you talk a bit, again in the book about things like meditation, cognitive behavioural therapy. Um, what what sort of things can we do to to um, you know to sort of do this realigning? Yeah, well, so I mean, I think stuff like meditation is fantastically useful and powerful, and, and, and CBT is to an extent, and there's motivational interviewing and all kinds of other psychological or sort of quote spiritual type uh, techniques. That's all fine. Uh, but uh, the idea of narrative is, is, is in a way more, more, a little bit more complex because narrative also includes not only where you're going to, but where you came from. Well, why is that important? Why do we need to have a sense of where we came from? And in the book, I talk about this research into native communities in Canada uh, in which there's a very high suicide rate in some of those communities among the young people. And in other communities, there isn't. The suicide rate is zero. And these researchers, Michael Chandler and his team went in there and they, they tried to figure out, well, why the huge difference? And what they discovered was that in the high suicide communities, these kids had no sense of where, where they came from. There were no elders, no tribal councils, no language uh, from, from the old days, just eating at McDonald's and, you know, just, just uh, so they didn't have any sense of themselves and nor did they have any sense of their own culture. Whereas in, in the zero suicide communities, they did have a lot of connections with the past. They kind of knew where they came from and that enabled them to construct a sense of where they were going to. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So in a sense, in a sense that addiction can be as much a cultural phenomenon as a, an, an individual one, that if we uh, change the, the way that we live together to be in a more harmonious way, then there would be less addiction. But back, back to Rat Park again, maybe. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's com it's complicated, and I don't claim to have all the answers for this, but I I think the the sense of what where you came from kind of acts as a, a culturally acts as a kind of scaffolding that holds together the pieces of your own life, and, and then as you become a teenager and a young adult, you can kind of draw out the sense of your own life as as having a direction, you know, a vector, a, a trajectory. Whereas addicts live in this kind of, you know, recurrent present, it's just repeating the same boring thing day after day. Uh, people, when people recover from addiction, move on, they they are saying, no, I'm I'm moving forward along this trajectory of my life. I came from here and I'm not stopping here. I'm going on and I'm going to become this kind of person or that kind of person. And And there's other subtleties too. For me, you know, I think... Well, addicts, if you buy the idea that addicts uh, have been through some kind of trauma or difficult, traumatizing experience, for me, for me, it was boarding school that, that knocked the hell out of me. Addicts often have a lot of shame and uh, they need to forgive themselves. And it's pretty hard to forgive yourself unless you have some sense of how you got to be the way you are. Sure, yeah. So, so if you can go back and sort of say, well, this is how I got this way. I went through all this crap and now... and I've been struggling with this depression for years and this is what I'm doing about it. If you can have that sense of yourself, you can start to forgive yourself and build on that and then say, okay, then I don't have to keep doing this. I can actually change that. That, that I think is something really important that we need to say more about. No, it sounds very interesting. Um, okay. Well, um, on this subject of narrative, Mark, earlier on, you said that one of your main objectives for writing the book, was to integrate the life of the brain with what's going on in our experience. Now, I, I thought you did this beautifully in the book by describing the stories of addiction of four people who who turn their lives around or turn this around through arguably what you know what, what we've just been saying, addressing the, the the conflicts created in their pasts. Now, th you know they they had support to do this, but cru crucially. There was also the recognition on their part that they needed to take charge themselves of their own recovery. Now, I, I found these stories really powerful and they, I, and they contained, I thought, a real message of, of hope and possibility. Was the, when, I presume that was your objective with these stories. Oh, well, yes, yes. It's, uh, the story, yeah, well, there's five actually, but one, one, of the, oh, yeah. one of the five was an eating disordered person. Um, you know, it's it's a very hard thing to connect what's going on in the brain with what's going on in our lives. It's uh, it's really hard. I mean, imagine trying to connect what's going on with your in, in your liver with what's going on in your life, right? I mean, you know, they, these 
organs in our bodies, these are assemblies of cells that do their things uh, with no regard to what we, to our verbal um, understanding or analysis of what's going on. They just do their things. They've evolved to work together to give us a life, to allow us to reproduce. That's all great. It's hard. <laughs> it's just hard. But, but it's all, it really happens. And, you know, it, it, what brings it to mind, I mean, if you've ever known someone who's had a stroke or a concussion, you see it right in front of your eyes that the brain is so, it's, it, it is, it's not just an organ, it's who we are. It's mm -hmm. pretty fundamental to what, who, what, what we are. It's this yeah. amazing organ that is like nothing else. Um, but maybe just look, um, explore this idea of narrative a little bit more, you know, because you, you were talking earlier about frogs, that the difference between reptiles and, say, mammals is that we, first of all, we have m motivation, but you could also argue like that such a thing as personhood is um, is about having a past uh, and, a, and a future. I mean, uh, I'm thinking of philosophers like um, Daniel Dennett and also Peter Singer talks about this in great, great depth. But, uh, do you see a correlation there with that idea of, of who we are and, and this? I absolutely, absolutely. I think it's absolutely essential. Without that, you know, now personhood, you could, <laughs> it's got its advantages and its disadvantages, right? Personhood is a, is a pretty important way to connect with the world and to be part of the world and to, to get stuff done. And that's all very well. But ever seen that TED talk of the woman who had this massive left hemisphere stroke? Jill Bolt Taylor. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Well, she describes her lack of personhood as a being a, a totally ecstatic experience, right? Yeah. Uh, but, but would you say that's a lack of personhood or is, or is it? seeing the world from a, a right hemisphere perspective. Well, you know, call it what you will, but I mean, I would call it a lack of personhood in a sense. I mean, personhood brings with it aloneness, isolation, disappointment, uh, loss, I mean, all the rest of it, we know, we know all about that. Whereas when you're just where you are in time and space, and, and that is flowing out to the horizons of your experience without a past or, or a future, well, there, there can be something quite magical and wonderful about that, uh, kind of almost a pure connection with your senses and with perhaps other aspects of the universe. But we don't seem to be able to function like that, right? No. And, and, and if you want to go back to the left versus right hemisphere thing, the right hemisphere is very good at uh, spontaneity and, uh, you know, this holistic and, and highly detailed, uh, per well, perception of what's going on right now. But the left hemisphere seems to have evolved language and the capacity to understand language because language is our code for addressing our, uh, what's going on in our lives in a, a logical, a codified, familiar way that does extend from past to present to future. And it's no accident that the, the, the left hemisphere is the one that does this linear thing. Yeah. It's yeah. able to draw a straight line through time. So it, so it sort of passes time in a sequential way, then. Yeah. Basically, yeah, yeah, and and that, and then you you talk about in the book, addiction can af can affect a part of our prefrontal cortex that can inhibit that way of interpreting time. Is that right? Yeah, more or less. I I think, I mean, you can't understand language if you don't have a sequence because all languages are arranged in sequence. In, in English, we have a subject verb object relationship, right? Here in the Netherlands, they have some kind of crazy deal with, uh, you know, the verb comes here and there. I don't know, it's super picked up. But um, it, there's always some sequence in time that, that language needs for in order to work. Well, the left hemisphere, okay, so it does that. It's really good at that. It probably evolved in large part so that we can communicate with each other using language, which is a fantastically good thing. Uh, very efficient, allows us to connect, cooperate, and work together, be together. Well, if you think about addiction, and especially, you know, hardcore, long-term addiction, you've, you've really kind of lost the capacity to think in terms of your own life as having a past, present, and a future. You are just in this now, this ongoing yeah. now. Of You're either in a state of pure need, which, they call, which we call craving, or else you're scoring. You get it. All right, I'm going to get high. Terrific. Great. It's just about now. Yeah.
And that's why I keep coming back to the connections between these issues. The uh, dopamine and the striatum and the, uh, the sensitization to reward, to a very particular reward, and this issue of now appeal or delay, de- delay discounting. The, the fact that the now becomes so bloody important as it approaches in time. And there's this hyperbolic function when they map this thing, you know, mathematically. There's this curve that goes up like that, really steeply rises. The value of the thing, the perceived value, suddenly becomes really uh, over uh, augmented as it becomes closer in time. And when you, when you talk to addicts, you know, getting high in 20 minutes versus getting high in six hours makes a big difference. Now, I can, I can see that. I can actually relate that to my own experience. I can remember when I was in my 20s and, I, I, you know, I used to go out and have a, uh, get drunk, etc. And, and, and I had very um, little, how should I put it, self-compassion for my future self. But as I've got older and I've had hundreds of hand, hangovers and, uh, and uh, yeah, and, you think, and I'm, that's the, that, you, you talk about self-compassion in the book. I've got more... I care more about my future self now than I did when I was a younger man. Yeah, yeah. And isn't that a sweet thing, right? I mean, it is you, right? <laughs> it is. And, uh, it's, it's almost a kind of generosity or, uh, uh, as we said, uh, a kind of altruism to care about your future self. It's almost like caring a little bit for someone else, but it's not quite someone else because it's you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but you know, uh, and, and this thing about time, so the addicts, I mean, their sense of time is really fucked up. And there are, there are some, there are a couple of studies that show this, but they don't show it very successfully that, uh, anyway, I, I won't bother with talking about that. But there's this guy named George Ainsley, who I think is the master when it comes to de- delay discounting and, and all this, uh, this stuff, what I call now appeal. And what he, what he says, and he talks about addiction. He's got this wonderful book. It's called Breakdown of Will. Okay. Fantastic title, right? Um, but Breakdown of Will. So what happens in addiction? Well, you lose your willpower. Well, what does that mean? You can't really hold on to for a future that isn't immediately you know, available. It's a future. It's not immediately available. So you're kind of stuck with, uh, with the moment. The way he says we need to resolve this 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 problem is by having what he calls intertemporal dialogue or intertemporal negotiation, uh, which I think I might refer to somewhere in the book. Uh, well, it sounds very complicated, but when you think about it, intertemporal means across time. Yeah. You're having a negotiation or a conversation with yourself across time, right? And there's, there have been studies now of quite a few, but one in particular – that comes to mind that shows that um, in this particular study, they show college kids uh, and they get them to uh, um, simulate uh, uh, what, what they're going to do with their money. And how much are they going to put away for saving for the future versus how much are they going to go out and spend? OK, that, that's the uh, experiment. Well, and then what they do is they take these kids and they morph their faces with, with face morphing technology and show them what they're going to look like when they're 65. <laughs> OK, and they just put that right on the screen. This is what you're going to look like when you're 65. And then they then they put them through the test again. How much money are you going to put away? How much money are you going to spend? I guess you can imagine. Brilliant. I love all these experiments. Anyway, just, just back to Johan Hari, uh, Mark. He says quite a pithy statement. He says the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, but connection. And this seems to be uh, what we're talk- talking about here. To what degree would you agree with that or would you use another term as the opposite of uh, addiction if you were if you were to take the addiction versus uh um being addicted versus being clean dichotomy and and put it in terms of the middle way yeah. we, we, we 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 danced a bit around that how would you do it well is there really a middle way between addiction and being you know free of drugs well not really when you arrange it like that but if you if you were to tilt it a bit and say that on the one hand you've got this feeling of well-being, and on the other hand you've got this this sense of future, taking care of yourself in the future, taking care of business, taking care of your life, uh, taking care, you know, taking care of, like you take care of a kid, right? Uh, well, when you when you do it that way, then then what's the opposite? Okay, so let's think about what addiction is. Is it actually what I think Harry is talking about with connection? He's really talking about opiates. 
opiates give you a sense of warmth and safety, which I, I get from my partner and from being connected to other people. So in that respect, uh, yeah, if you're not getting it from the opiates, then you need to get it from other people, just like the rats in Rat Park. Okay, but let's say we take that dichotomy and we tilt it a bit okay. um, and say that just call addiction a sense of well-being. And then the converse would be um, a sense of not of not well-being, a sense of being at odds or being uh, uh, disturbed. Yeah. Right. And then. I sorry, I'm just thinking out loud. I'm yeah, that's good. Too much sense. Um, then the opposite of addiction it's not really an opposite, uh, but the opposite of addiction w- would be taking care of yourself. So that's a bit of a different way of putting it. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. And, then, and then those two opposites, so-called opposites, like the two mules, confuse. They, they, they can, they can work together. Yeah. Are, are you in balance when you are addicted? No, you're not. But, but. I would say you're not in balance either when all of your energies are devoted to taking care of the future. That's true. Yeah. So, so, so I, I, I would go with you guys in the middle way here. I would say we, we need a middle way between these, these two, uh, these two sim- seemingly uh, polar extremes. Just sticking with this idea, the, the idea of integration as well. I think the model, the, the learning model you propose is very much an integrative one uh, in that you, t- you seem to take what's best from the other models without the more obvious drawbacks. So, for example, from the disease model, there's the acknowledgement there is a degree of dysfunctionality or, you know, for want of a better word, with the type of learning involved with addiction. But, but on the other hand, you know, the, d- the disease model is disempowering. And then with the choice model, there's the recognition in, your, in the learning model that, that willpower is an important component for recovery, but doesn't hold with the more dogmatic interpretation of the model, yeah, of this model as an absolute belief in free will that we talked about. And then, and then, and then also, as you said earlier, the, the learning model is entirely compatible with the self-medication model. So it takes what's best. From, you know, it doesn't say all these other ideas are just totally bad, but you take yeah. what's good from them. And it seems to marry all these these ideas. I think it's a very integrative one. Would would you agree? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And that's that's a very that's a very encouraging thing to say. And I hadn't thought about it so much that way, but I think you're right. I do try to take the best of, of the different models because yeah. they they each do have a certain uh, uh, um, element of uh, well of importance and and insight. So yeah, I, I, I think I do try to try to do that. Yeah, you have, however, been called a zealot, haven't you? <laughs> what, what, what was behind that? Oh, I think it was just a stupid review. You know? <laughs> it was the Washington Post, so it was, uh, well, it's good to get a review in the Washington Post, no matter what they say, I suppose. But, uh, well, you know, I think she said that because I said over, I said many times, so you see, addiction really isn't a disease. And maybe I did say it a couple of times too often, but I think when you're making a point that isn't obvious to people, sometimes you have to repeat it quite a number of times. Yeah. I've learned I've learned that as a teacher, right? <laughs> well, I know I'm an ex-teacher too, so I'm very familiar with that as well. Okay, um, well, we, we danced around the idea of the middle way, but what, what is your understanding of the, the middle way um Mark and and you know and how might that relate to what we've been talking about today? Well, I, I think we're sort of arriving at that through through conversation and and I, I you've given me a wonderful opportunity to think out loud. By the way, I've already recommended your site to two other people, even though I haven't had time to explore it in very much depth at all myself, but I've read a bit of it and. Uh, well, thank you. I mean, I I like it. I think I think it's really cool. <laughs> um. Okay, so let, let's just say that instead of po- uh, posing addiction versus being clean, that doesn't work. You don't. There's no middle way there. No. Right. But if you if you rotate it a bit and say addiction means just being in the moment and just having just diving for that feeling of well being, and the and the converse then is just taking care of business, and keeping you know being pro- 
productive, uh, functional, whatever, you know, put those. Well, okay. Then when you put it that way, you can see that both things are rather important to a person's life, to a person's happiness and uh, uh, being able to be a good person in all, all kinds of ways. And then you can say, okay, we can find a middle way. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It's You can have a sense of well-being and joy and uh, upliftedness and optimism that corresponds with feeling that you're taking care of yourself. I'm taking care of myself. I'm feeling proud of myself. I'm feeling happy about the fact that I don't have to go out and get drugs today. I don't have to go out and get drugs this weekend. I don't have to, you know, I don't have to finish this bottle just because I have one drink. And then you get the whole harm reduction, uh, which I think is quite a valuable idea that people don't necessarily have to stop taking all substances. No, they, they, if they can find a, a balance, it's all about balance. It's really about balance, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm having a, well, I finished my, uh, my drink. <laughs> it's, uh, don't, don't forget, it's an hour later here. So it's, uh, I, n I never have a drink before 5.30 or 6. But, um, uh, you know, but I'm not going to have seven drinks. I'm going to have maybe two. Yeah. Right? So that, that's the sort of thing I'm thinking about. I had um, an issue with alcohol for, for many years. Um, come 8 o'clock in the evening... I couldn't totally relax until I'd had a can of beer. And it often only had to be one, but it used to really piss me off that I couldn't uh, just relax without that. But I seem to have found a way now. Where I've sort of set sort of little guidelines, a bit like you with, for myself. So like, because I've got a guest house, I can only go out one night a week. But so I'm, I'm allowed to have a drink when I go out. And also I have a drink if, if I have guests to come yeah, around yeah. and stuff like that. And, and also, I'm also allowed to break the rules now and again, you know, for some special occasion, or if, even if I was, as you say, if I fuck yeah. up now and again, you know, and, I'm, and I don't beat myself up if my rules get broken. But I've, I've managed, for, I've been doing that for about five years now, and I've seemed to have found a, a, a balance with that now that works for me. Exactly. I, I, yeah, exactly. That kind of flexibility, even allowing yourself to break the rules now and then, I think that's beautiful. I think that's that's the ideal solution to to our our desire, our wish for for pleasure and uh, uh, satisfaction and getting out of ourselves and all that stuff. It's not going to go away that those feelings. On the other hand, you know, you don't have to get lost in it. Yeah. I mean, you, right? You can still take care of business. So I think it's an ideal way of thinking about the middle way. That that there there really is a middle way here. Smashing. Oh, well, that's that's brilliant. Just last couple of questions, uh, Mark. What's your greatest hope for the book? Yeah, good question. Uh, I, I think the book, the detractors, the, the critics, uh, well, they have a point that my book could, if, if a lot of people really start to uh, dispense with the disease model, there could be an interruption in care and services for addicts in places like the US. But I hope that's a short term effect, if, if anything. The present care, the, the rehab industry, the uh, right now in the US is very, very flawed. It's corrupt. There's a lot of people making a lot of money. And there's a lot of addicts who are not getting better and who go back again and again and again and again and are, are selling their, their mortgages and they're selling their kids' college funds to do it. Uh, it's not working well, but I don't want the book to mess up the capacity for addicts to get help from the available resources. What I hope is that my book will join with other people who also see addiction as a learning process and a social process. People like Bruce Alexander and Carl Hart and uh, Gabor Maté as a developmental process. The, the, these these lines of, of thinking will, will come together and form a very powerful incentive to redefine how we think about it, really seriously redefine it so that we get it completely differently. And then, then there won't be any stigma. It's not about you don't get rid of stigma by saying it's a disease. You get rid of stigma by really understanding it. You know, and I, I, I hope that the book will help that process to uh, so sort of get rid of the stigma, understand it deeply, scientifically, neurally, but also clinically, so that so that people can help 
addicts help themselves and they really as we've said really do have to help themselves yeah well i hope so too mark and uh, for what it's worth i read your book and i thought it was um, found it really inspiring to read it and and re would recommend it to anyone out there okay oh, and the, you, you're welcome and uh, um, my last my last question if people wanted to find out more about your work how would they go about it oh probably uh, come to my website if, if you Google my name, you'll, you'll just Mark Lewis, you'll, you'll probably get to my website pretty soon and a few talks and stuff. And the website, the main thing I do on the website, I've got, you know, reviews and stuff and praise and all that stuff. But the main, the main thing is the blog. And I, I do blog posts every week or two. But I've got a lovely community of people who are, um, well, subscribers and so forth. And they, they respond. And it's not like the usual shit we often get. You know, people like just lashing out at each other. These are really intelligent and uh, uh, lovely people, many of whom are ex-addicts or recovering addicts or partially recovering. Uh, I think there's a great dialogue going there, and I hope that other people will, will come and join us in that dialogue. Great. Well, I'll, I'll put the links on, on the site for that as well. Well, um, thanks very much for talking to me t uh, today, Mark. It's been a real pleasure. It's been fascinating. It's been great sure. fun, too. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Barry. I, I hope we meet in person someday. Oh, well, you'll have to come on one of our retreats. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll just do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.